future studies as a as a discipline as a practice is about the plurality of the future that there isn't one future there's not a future of work that there's so many articles talk about the future of work that well there there isn't a future of work there's there's a plurality of choices that we can make and the decisions that we make in the present ooh, lead us to whatever that future is but the thing with design is that it's always it always works on quite short quite often works on quite short timelines so sort of one to three years is how often we think about strategy or a design project and, and even the even the big design project that we did for immigration that was sort of three years probably something like that maybe a little bit longer from from initial conversation but more and more we're told that we should be doing really rapid cycles of things we we're doing things in sprints we're testing things with people we're just doing 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 but we don't really look at the consequences of what, we, of, uh, of what we might be doing. So it's really about, yes, design can be this really good thing, but let's think about the future more broadly. Let's think about our impact and what we want to create, what, what are aspirational things that we want to do. Let's question those things and have, and have some critical thought about those things. And let's be really purposeful in, in terms of creating positivity within what we're trying to do, but let's also acknowledge the plurality of these things as well. Let's acknowledge that what is good to me is awful to someone else. Welcome to Design Drives, your audio experience about what, how, and why design drives things forward. A podcast hosted by Sebastian Gear, together with forward-thinking design practitioners from around the world. So in this episode, I talk with Chris Jackson about his journey to New Zealand, now working in the service design area and the strategic design area, collaborating with a lot of public services and governments on public programs. Chris transformed himself from a furniture designer working a lot on sustainable furniture in the UK and now working as a strategic and service designer in New Zealand. We also learn a little bit about the design industry in New Zealand, about the design opportunities there, what is different there, and also about working with large government programs and working on public projects that improve the citizen experience and really trying to influencing the future of citizens in a positive way. We're also going to talk a little bit about outcomes and not look at outputs in the design process as well as the diversity of futures. Your design future might be awful to someone else. That was something that came up in our conversation that we have to be open to different futures and not the singular future because futures can go at a lot of different directions in different environments so i really hope you enjoy the episode again this is a collaboration between the industrial designer society of america idsa and design drives and we recorded this slightly after the idc conference in chicago end of last year so hope you enjoy it. hey chris how are you doing i'm very well thank you sebastian how are you I'm great. I'm uh, I'm excited to speak to you. You know, speaking about your background and design in New Zealand and a lot of other topics. So maybe uh, for the audience, for the people who don't know you, maybe it would be great if you could just share a little bit of your your background and what you do at the moment and you know where you're coming from. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. I look at the other people on this podcast and sort of think, what am I doing here when there's there's people from all these very esteemed companies. So thank you for the opportunity. So my name is Chris Jackson. I am founder and director of a company in New Zealand based in Wellington, New Zealand called We Create Futures. We are a practice that mixes design, strategy and anthro complexity or, or complexity science really. We try and overlap those three things as much as we can to sort of deal in complex and complicated problem spaces. My background is, so I've got 20 years experience in design. I'm originally from the UK. I did a furniture and product design degree from 1996 until 2000. I did a master's degree in furniture, in furniture design in 2000 to 2002. I then moved to London and started up a small design studio. We were sort of doing our own work, showing work in Milan doing work around London called Northwest Design Studio. And, and we were part of a couple of collectives through that period. So we had a collective called Shift and we did an exhibition called Timeframe through that that was 
exploring local manufacturing with his, uh, within East London. Before I left, I curated a sustainable design exhibition called 10 that was 100% design. So that was people like Tamalko Azumi and Michael Maria and, and Gitta Jusvetner and different people from around London. And they were asked to a designer and create an object that talked about their ideas of sustainability within London for like 10 pounds and they had to work in a 10 kilometer radius within their studios. So that was one of the things that I did before I left. In 2007, left the UK, traveled for a year. Myself and my wife just wanted to escape the UK and escape London and everything that we were doing. Ended up in New Zealand. We were supposed to be here for six weeks and then I think it's 12 or 13 years later, we're still here. <laughs> oh, wow. So did you guys, when you just were starting to travel from the UK, did you just say you just go to New Zealand and then maybe to another country or something like that? Or were you just saying we just go for a few weeks to New Zealand? We, we got one-way tickets to Mumbai. So we sold most of the stuff that we own. We got one-way tickets to Mumbai. Okay. And then after that, we, we had like, We decided we had a sort of year. We saved up. We got married. We saved up some money to travel for three months. We saved enough money to travel for three. We said we'd save up for six. That turned into 12 months. So then we said we'd travel for a year to get to New Zealand um, mm -hmm. and then sort of see if we could find places to live along the way. So we went all through Southeast Asia, Australia, traveled around New Zealand. And then when we got to Wellington, We ended up getting jobs and I ended up as a lecturer in industrial design at Massey University, which is a good university here in New Zealand. From there, I got connected with the Fab Lab, with MIT, Centre for Bits and Atoms, started the first Fab Lab in Australasia, held the annual Fab Lab conference in 2012 here in New Zealand. So I had like lots of people from MIT come out, all that stuff. After that, I had some changes in, in terms of what I wanted to do within, within my practice. And, and I sort of had a choice of either staying in academia and going down that route and like doing a PhD and, and really going deep into that academic design uh -huh. stuff or trying to get back into a more commercial place. Now, in I think what's different for me about New Zealand when I was practicing being a, a furniture and product designer and as a sort of not really an industrial designer, like big runs of plastic products or anything like that, we would do we we would do things like rotor molded furniture, but not in like huge huge, huge runs like rotor molded lighting with companies and things like that. But I think the real difference in New Zealand is I thought I'd get here and I'd be able to operate in the same way that I did when I lived in London. So you can make a living in London or you could then be a sort of designer and a maker and doing interior design projects and curating exhibitions and doing some teaching on the side and doing some work with manufacturers and actually creating lots of stuff yourself and when you get to New Zealand it's a totally different economy it's a totally different scale of people there's like four million people in New Zealand there's not a huge culture or conversation about design outside of metropolitan centers like Christchurch and Auckland and Wellington and it, it is really an economy based around agriculture and tourism and some now more so tech And, and other things that are, that are bubbling up. But that's only in the, the last sort of five to seven years, really. So it's very hard mm -hmm. if you're not in a bigger industrial design organization, like a company like Fisher and Paykel or a company like Formway Furniture, it's really hard to be an independent designer and like have a, have a, a lifestyle or a practice that, that you could have within the UK. So... What was, what was changing at that time, though, was that human-centered design practices in government particularly and in, in the public sector were being taken up much, much more. And they were looking for people who had experiences in design and taking that into government. So when I left... Academia, in New Zealand, you're saying? In New, you're saying in New, in New Zealand, right? Yeah, yeah. In, in, in New Zealand... In like 20, I suppose from about 2007, from 2007 onwards, like 
places like the Inland Revenue Department were looking, were developing design practices like service design and experience design within what they were doing. That started to build out of government. And in around 2012, there was lots of government departments looking for 2012, 2013, people were looking more and more for human-centered design practitioners. So I, I sort of strategized to use all of that human-centered design practice that I'd learn and taught students and everything else and use that as a way to sort of sidestep my career a lot of my work's always been quite strategic so i've done i can remember doing like a service design project in 2005 when people weren't really calling it service design then it was just like yeah. people weren't really sure what, what what these things were called necessarily so i'd always done quite strategic things and doing curating exhibitions like 10 it was strategic to talk about sustainability in in sort of 2005 2006 and look at sustainability and go there's all this talk about sustainable design but who's doing really practical stuff that's not super theoretical or not really academic who are doing really practical things that other designers could see and sort of be mm -hmm. inspired by that and what does that mean from a strategic point of view so I left academia and went and worked in the Ministry of Justice for like, it ended up being 10 months. I, I was there for a few months. The Christchurch earthquake had happened. They were rebuilding Christchurch, basically. And the, the, the Ministry of Justice was looking how it redeveloped the sort of just, they called it the Justice Centre. And, and, and it was sort mm -hmm. of police and corrections and the Ministry of Justice, all to, uh, the the courts there all in one sort of precinct together and how they all in, interacted and worked together from like a service design and a service perspective. So we ended up being part of our service design team was seconded to, a, to an innovation team to work on that project for a while. That project didn't go so well for us necessarily. And, and I, and I started speaking to some design agencies saying, would you employ someone like me to, to come and do service design, customer experience? I ended up going to work for an agency called DNA, who were a really good customer experience agency. I was there for four years, did all sorts of really good work, like all sorts of work through government, uh, did some private sector stuff. So where I am in Wellington, Wellington is the seat of parliament. So it's the capital, it's not the biggest city. So Auckland's the biggest city. That's a bit, that's more commercial in terms of how it is as a city. Wellington mm -hmm. is more sort of public sector focused because parliament's here and, you know, there's, there's MPs, lots of, the, lots of government is here. So lots of agencies within Wellington work, work with, uh, with government departments, basically doing user experience, human centered design, service design, customer experience type work. So that's what we were doing. I, I was service, service innovation director at DNA for four years. And through that time, I was always looking at how can we develop. I, I've always thought, you know, designers are always, especially in design education, designers are always told that they can save the world. Like they, they're always getting told design's the most important thing. Design can save the world. It can do all this stuff. And I sort of think it's true to a point, but I, I, I also think designers get sold this thing about what they're capable of that is not necessarily true. And when they leave academia and, and get into the workplace, and, and I think this has changed over the past 10 years, particularly as well, as people move into more strategic roles and they're doing things like, and they're doing things like service design. There's a lot of stuff that's involved in that that's political. And there's a lot of stuff that's about influencing people and there's a lot of stuff about just getting people on side in a project even to make a project happen that you've got to work really collaboratively with people you've got to have a load of skills that you're not really taught at university that you learn or you're quite naturally good at but also there's a load of, there's some weaknesses in design that other areas are like other practices and people are, have either dealt with or they've got tools to work with them that designers just aren't open to necessarily. So when I was at DNA, I, I, part of my job was to help develop the practice of what we were doing. 
And I always thought in terms of more strategic work that we were doing, that there was an opportunity to be more strategic and do more strategy that's not just strategic design. It's like hardcore strategy work, but in new in new ways. There are these irretractable problems that we're supposed to deal with that we think we can solve that we can't, that we don't have the tools to deal with within a complex system. And then there's ways that we can help people when we've dealt with a load of that stuff. There's ways that we can help people in terms of problem solving or creating a service or whatever that we're really good at that can flow out of the back of that. That started to build into a thing for me of Okay, so these, these tools in sort of futures and strategic foresight that helps you think about the future in a, a much more creative way. There's this practice of sort of complexity and anthro complexity where you understand where you are in a system and, and you understand what problem spaces you are in and you're able to choose the right tools and work within a complex system. And then there's all this knowledge that we have in in terms of human-centered design, that we can help create experiments or services or whatever it might be that all could flow out of the back of that in terms of creating impact for an individual or an organization or whatever that might be. And that's really what we try and do. We, we combine those three things to work in complex problem spaces or help, help people think about the future in a, in a much more considered way and really help them let go of a lot of the baggage that they have in terms of the present and how they think about their organizations or the present as it stands now in order for them to be more strategic. That was a really long-winded answer to, to your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Maybe it would be, I think it was super, so many points there I can, you know, I would love to expand on. But, you know, something particular, I think, would be, you know, you were mentioning that a lot of people, you know, when they come out of design school, they maybe miss some of that, you know, to make that kind of a big of a change as a designer or impact. But what's interesting, you made sort of that transformation from someone from a furniture design background, talking a lot about, you know, sustainable ability in the UK now towards working very much you know on government customer experience I mean, very strategic kind of and bookend of design you also did some education things like I think you got an MBA as well so you know how did you for yourself you know you know learned all these tools or you know transformed yourself into you know being capable of that you know or you know was it by opportunity was it by doing or you know you know maybe you can expand on that a little bit so the the mba that i did which is a bit of a hack was was seth golden's all mba so it's not really an mba but what what seth says is that it teaches you all of the tools that an mba should teach so it's it's not mm -hmm. really a, an mba But uh, okay, it's it's good that people think I have one if they do. So that, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that on my LinkedIn profile. That's good. I think I've never been content with just sitting still. So I've I've never ever gone. I've never gone. This is what I'm doing. I'm just gonna stay in this lane. I've always been really curious. Like like all we as we're told that all designers should be you should be curious to be a good designer. So to me, curiosity means going out and looking outside of your discipline and outside of design to think what is happening within the world and what is, what is stuff that I can see that might be a, a hole in my practice or a weakness or something that design doesn't do very well or that I'm interested in that I want to do that, that might be a, a sidestep from what you do. So it's, It's natural for furniture designers to start playing into an interior design space and they start to design environments and micro environments and they start to also then they can move into exhibition design a little bit and do a certain type of exhibition design not like big you know fair type stuff but there's there's a certain type of design that they can do so you start to expand your horizons and 
and you're practicing that way. And, and I think in a way, there's sort of talk of it, when you talk to industrial designers and furniture, and, and furniture designers, they say how they're, they're a breed that can move into these different areas, like small pieces of architecture, whatever that might be. But I also think I've always had a thirst. I've always had a thirst for knowledge. And I've always wanted to, I'm always, re, I had a real issue that for the last year or so, I've had to really force myself not to read books about design because that's all I that's all I do. Like generally, I read a book about design or something that's related to to design or strategy. And now I'm I'm going. I've got to read more novels. I've got to read more sci-fi for what I do. I've got I've, I've got to do all these things. And I've always I've always been really collaborative. So I've always had side projects. I've always had something where even though I might be teaching i'm trying to like enter a design competition or i'm trying to collaborate with a fashion lecturer to look at what sustainable the to look at how fashion can influence furniture design or i'm trying to collaborate with a graphic designer to to bring like a more graphic sensibility to to whatever i'm doing the more you expose yourself to a, to a breadth of things and a breadth of people I think the, the, the more that you can move in different ways in your career. And I think I've, I've always been quite like entrepreneurial in the sense that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not like someone that can create a startup and make hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever and come out and sell it and everything else. But I am quite entrepreneurial in terms of hustle, hustle in a good way. Not, not, not the idea of hustling someone out of money, like, you know, Paul Newman in The Color of Money or whatever else. The, the, the idea of hustle that someone like Jan Chipchase talks about where when he talks about doing really good research and being in the field and actually when you have nothing in front of you, when, when there's like just a void of opportunity, how can you create an opportunity out of nothing? And I've always been quite good at creating an opportunity out of nothing that sits there and then using that as like something that has gravitational pull to sort of pull people's interest to it. And that can be quite a draining thing to do. Like you, you have to give that time and you have to be doing work outside your normal work hours and, and doing all these things that maybe aren't as, you know, as demanded of people now as they used to be. You used to be expected, especially in the UK, to work long hours and, and do all these things. There's there's more of a reaction against that stuff now. And rightly so, like having, having a good balance of things that you enjoy is really good. But I also think when you're a designer, that design is a lifestyle. Like it's not, you don't get into design to do it as a nine to five job. You don't like be an accountant and go, right, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to clock into work. I'm going to do my work for seven or eight hours and it's finished and I'm done. Say like designs a lifestyle. You live it all the time. Like you think about it all the time. Whether it's like the clothes that you're buying, how the car door opens that you get in in your Uber or your Zoomy or your taxi, however you're traveling. When you're in a city, what architecture looks like. You never switch off. And just being inspired by that, and uh, and like just being a designer and having that curiosity and and being open enough to go, actually design is not the be all and end all of everything. There's all this other stuff out there. How can it make design better? I think that's what has in, enabled me or, or sort of been the catalyst for me to be able to move into different spaces. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about what you do exactly on the, the government side? I was actually not aware that it's such a big thing in New Zealand. Obviously, this conversation about design and government is picking up, uh, using the service design approach, picking up in, uh, in in the UK quite quite a lot actually. But I wasn't aware it's so uh, such a big deal in New Zealand. So maybe you can expand on that a little bit, like how you use design uh, in that specific domain. Like I said, there have been people doing strategic design in New Zealand at government for coming up to sort of 13 years now. And it, and it might not have originally been called that, but that's what they were doing. Yeah. And out of that has, has, has built a bigger movement. So even in like 2013, 2014, we were running GovJams 
in government to help build capability in terms of service design capability. So, uh, so a few design agencies, and I was in the Ministry of Justice at that time, 2013, and we, were, we sort of banded together to run like a service design jam during the week for people who were interested from different departments to come and, and build some skills. So in, in almost every government department in, in New Zealand, there'll be a service design team probably. So mm-hmm. Ministry of Business and Innovation, IRD, um, the Inland Revenue Department, IRD, the Ministry for Primary Industries, Department of Conservation. A lot of these places all have a service design team or a UX team or something like that. Interesting. They've all historically had sort of graphic design and marketing teams, but that started to build out in, in, in terms of specifically service design because it, obviously in government, you have government services that need to be delivered and they need to be designed by people and... So it so it made sense in in government. It, it's an easy, it's an easy. It's not, it's not a conceptual leap to go. Okay, we, we deliver services. People need to design them. Let's make them more human centered. I think, like you said, so out of so two thousand five, when like Project Red was happening in the Design Council in the UK, that was when people were were, were really starting to talk about more. The, the design of services and the design of experiences and that stuff out of the design council turned into sort of double diamond and all that stuff that then built out. When I got to, to the Ministry of Justice, GDS had just been stood up. So government digital services in the UK had just, either they'd just been stood up or they were going for about six months. So when that happened and people were being pulled from the private sector into the public sector that made designers look differently at working within the public sector because then they weren't just going oh no one does that they were going wow like a load of people like ben terra and other people who'd had a lot of success commercially that changed designers perspectives on on what they could do within government and how successful they could be those teams are responsible internally for for you know designing services and building service design capability but they'll also work with external vendors or design agencies as partners or they will contract external design agencies to do service design work for them and you know so that that can have more or less success depending on circumstance i i think when i talk you know, when I said earlier about there's a political nature of doing sort of service design and these other things within either a private company or a public company, that's, that's a small P political and it's a big P political also. There's the politicization of making things work within your organization. And then obviously within government, there's the politicization of is this part of a bigger government agenda or or is it part of a project that's really going to get some traction because it's really prioritized and 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 really important and i think within any any government organization just to deliver a successful design project is a massive achievement because you, you've got so m- much other stuff that you're dealing with that's quite different to being just like client side in an organization that can get stuff done, even though that can be challenging as well, or, or being a design agency and just being sort of left alone to deliver things sometimes. I think just delivering within government is, is, is just a massive achievement. And there's some really good work that happens within New Zealand. I, I really think that we, we do really good service design work within the public sector, and there's lots of evidence for this. I also think we're sort of world leading in terms of social innovation and some of the work we do on the social side that's, you know, working with, working with indigenous people within New Zealand, working with Maori and them, them actually doing their own work. Like now, now we're at a stage within New Zealand where we're looking at how do we indigenize design processes and not just use these Western design processes that have sort of been forced on us in it in a bit of a colonizing manner we're looking at how do we do design that's centered around 
Maori concepts of family and and Maori principles and and the way that they live their lives, which is to me it's sort of world leading stuff. And and we're going to see more of this stuff come out of of New Zealand in the next sort of twelve twenty four months. I don't think what I said, and this is what I was saying in Chicago, we're not very good at telling our stories. And, and a lot of the stories that get told about design come out of America, come out of Europe, and they're big, sort of brash, lots of money behind them, lots of these amazing stories. And, and New Zealand culture is not really like that. It's like quite, quite self-deprecating. We don't like to shout about what we do. But mm-hmm. one of my one of my drivers in, in terms of trying to drive what we do within New Zealand is actually get out and tell some of these stories. Like you, you not even knowing that we've been doing like human centered design within government for, for more than a decade, you know, that, that, that says something to me about how, who we are at like getting our, our stories out into the world. So we do really good work. We, so, so, just as some examples of things that we used to do with government, like we, we, designed, we designed a service to help exporters understand what they need, needed to do to, to export different, different products. So, so when you export food or export fruit and vegetables, there's lots of different rules for different countries. Mm-hmm. And all these rules are really hard to understand and they're all, they all can be completely different. And they all start to define how you process something or manufacture something, whatever it might be. So, so we did a project to, to just help that, help make that a lot easier for people and help them understand what they needed to do at a really early stage in order to give them the, the, the best chance to be really successful exporters. We did a project, one of, one of our big projects earlier on at, at DNA, one of the first ones that, we, that I did when I was there. We redesigned the New Zealand immigration experience. We did lots, I, I did, I led a lot of the research around that. What, one of my friends and colleagues, Chiara Montelioni, was a big part of that project. And along with Charlene Ture that led the the interaction design for that stuff. So we redesigned the New Zealand immigration experience from that was really hard to understand, hard to understand what points you could get within a system, hard to understand how you could move between different visas, what the visa types were, what you needed to do, to something that worked in natural language, uh, really un- unfolded a journey out in front of you. That won like a series of awards. It won an IXDA award. The team went out to New York and were there with people like Microsoft and, and Google and other people like that, which to me is a bigger achievement than it normally would be because in, in New Zealand, we deal with such small amounts of money. Like there's small budgets, there's small amounts of money. We have to drain every bit of value that we can. And to be in a, on a stage with someone like Microsoft who have really big teams that they, they can yeah. throw money at, you know, it, it shows that New Zealand, did, to me, does really good design work. Once again, that, 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 that's comparable to anything within the rest of the world. But again, those stories aren't out there necessarily. Yeah, but you know, luckily we do this podcast, so it will be, <laughs> all be shared. <laughs> I'm wondering a little bit, I think it's interesting, like I was actually about to ask you about some of the examples and I think you were expanding on them a little bit. So I think this was great. I think also when it comes to innovation, that space, I think and data is also something that's always important. I mean, I guess if you look to, you know, if you map it all out, if you look at uh, this, you know, the audit journey of citizens going, for example, to the embassy, or to some other institute you map all that out you try to make you know reduce friction at certain areas at some areas maybe friction is important but like very often i think and especially if you're thinking about maybe digitalizing some of that process i assume that also plays a role you also face that issue with data sometimes or like where do data get transferred in order to enable this because this is obviously an enabler to remove friction out of the process and maybe you can talk a little bit about you know some of your learnings there when it comes to um, you know reinventing some of the processes in terms of government services i i think 
a lot of the data that I deal with in terms of my own work is a, a lot of qualitative research data. And, and I can talk to that a little bit in, in a minute. But just to give the example of the New Zealand Immigration Project, Charlene, who, who was our experience director when I, was at, when I was at DNA, interaction designer, her whole thing, like she had a big buzz around data models. And by creating really good data models, you, you could create journeys and, and like natural language experiences for people within digital that was quite different to doing traditional information architecture and laying things out in, in a different way. So through, through a lot of the bigger projects, because these are like bigger projects now, you can't do, you can't redesign data models or, or like hook things up through APIs or whatever it might be on like smaller amounts of money. You've got to spend time doing that work and working with multiple people and finding all the data and where it sits and how it's captured and, and all this stuff. But in, in the bigger projects that we were doing at DNA, a lot, of the, a lot of the magic happened or a lot of the hard work happened in the back end within the data model. And then all of the, all of the front end development and front end interaction relied on, you know, that um, the redesign of the data model in order to be able to take information from disparate parts of, it could be like different websites that it, it used to be over. But being able to pull it together in, in a way that, that hid a lot of complexity from the user in order to present it in a really simple way for them to be able to, to move on through choices and, and be able to fulfill their goals in, in, in terms of what they needed to do within that journey. So, yeah, I, I, I think in, in a digital context, working in a really modern way on like bigger projects where you where you're dealing with lots of data that that's really essential in terms of the work that we're particularly interested in now it's it's more about how we think about strategy and and how we think about complexity it's more about stories so it's about stories and people and capturing narratives and it's not always like stories in terms of a big research project but it might be capturing micro narratives from people which turn into data points that are completely different from what we were talking about, but they they start to they start to present a picture of a situation that you can start to go, okay, so from the stories that people tell, this is how they see their world. This is what's really positive about their world, and this is the negative stuff. And how can we start to dampen and reduce the negative stories? And how how can we get them to tell more positive stories? And through telling these more positive stories, you, you start to create vectors of change that work within organizations organically in order to move them in, in uh, different directions. So I think there's really diverse ways that you can talk about data. And, and I think we, we can sort of get stuck on these ideas of big data and having, having all this data means we can make really decisions, which doesn't always mean that. And how can we use data in really contextually specific ways that help us achieve goals that we're trying to do within our projects? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's very interesting what you point out is that, you know, can actually have a lot of impact. It doesn't need to be always the innovation on the back end. And when it comes to the data that you know, removes friction in terms of the service experience, but it can be also uh, a lot of other things, you know, looking at the stories and, you know, doubling down on things that maybe already are positive, right. And, you know, celebrating that experience more. And, you know, so I think this is, this is super interesting. And, you know, how is it when, uh, when you do that kind of process, when it comes to getting user feedback do you have uh, you're just standing in front of the embassy and grabbing the people like how <laughs> but i think like it's these services are used so much right and in a very public way as well i guess you have quite a lot of access to users then right it just depends it, it, it just depends on the project and the context and you know like sometimes you know i'm i'm, I'm not doing so much government work now as as well what i used to do i'm 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 working more more in the private sector, but doesn't really matter from private to public. The way that you 
think about a research question and the way that you understand the audience that you need to speak to and then being able to reach that audience in in a way that gives you really good data out of the back end those approaches and principles are always the same whether you need to whether you're, a, you, you're able to access data to recruit people to speak to or you need to go through a recruitment firm in order to disintermediate yourself from that process. But also sometimes I think you're so constrained within, within a project that making the project happen however you can. So, so that might be a bit of guerrilla recruitment or rolling recruitment on a project or finding people through social media, whatever else it is, as, as long as you do it in a, in a really good ethical framework, then you've got to work within the constraints. And, and sometimes when we were working for government, government organizations that might be I can't remember the name, but they might be the, not the legislator, but they, you know, that they sort of police that sector or they look at what's going on within the sector. Then they would give you, give you a list of people and, and say, these are the people that you need to speak to and they have to speak to you, which is, you know, the, the, but in, when you're working in a more customer facing way, when when you're working in a more custom, I, I had I had issues with that sometimes, but but companies were good to speak to you through that process. But when you're working in a more customer facing way or a more citizen facing way, maybe you have to give people you you have to convince people that that, that it's a good thing. So you have to incentivize people. So when we were trying to get people to speak to us about our immigration experience, there there was a monetary incentive to get them to do that because you need to value people's time also. But like people are giving you an hour or an hour of 15, an hour and a half of their time. You have to value that and not just expect that it's going to come for free. You should be willing to give them like we, I suppose a, a, a hundred, 150 up to $250 depending on what you're willing to give people for them to value that information. Now you don't tell you don't tell them a monetary amount until after say or the, otherwise it can start to skew your participants and and who might come and speak to you but you know there there's all these different ways that you can approach that but you're always constrained by the nature of the project and and how how you need to execute it and what the context is yeah super interesting you know it's something you know else i would like to touch on i think the name also of your company super interesting we create futures right yeah. and you know i mean considering your background in you know design you basically you know by that basically saying right with design in some way or the other you basically you know create futures and i think there's a lot of discussions these days about the importance of design I mean, you saw obviously a lot of evolution of that. You know, you were mentioning the services and happening since so so long already, but in the past I didn't call it that way, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that could be really something interesting for you, maybe to you know expand on how you use design and also create futures and, and the importance of that. Yeah, I, I, just even these concepts of how old design is. So, so the first service blueprint, I. I I think the first sort of recorded service blueprint, whether it was in an academic paper or whatever it was, is like 1960. The, you know, early design thinking conferences were on the way that designers think as opposed to sort of the D school model were like 1960. A lot of these things that people come to and think are, are quite new actually have a hit, sort of 60 year history now of, of how they've evolved. And a lot of the stuff that sits within them sits outside of design. So a lot of a canon of knowledge sits outside of design. So I, I think sometimes you ask service designers to define what a service is and they can't even do it because they've come into these, they've come into these pathways of, of these names and w without having a real look at what the canon of, of the history of the discipline is and where it comes from in terms of service innovation or customer service or business or whatever it is. And, and they just think they can take a human centered design practice and then lay it over anything without understanding like some of the core tenants or, you know, like product service systems, whatever these things are, there's, there's not enough deep thinking about some of these stuff, but going back. So, so that to me just, 
I suppose the reason that I say that is designers can do better in terms of understanding some of the context that suddenly design is about experiences or design is now services or design is all these things that we tack onto it. Um, but like you say, design is inherently about creating the future. And it's about, if, if you think of Herb Simon's quotes about what, what design is or lots of the other quotes, it's, it's about taking, taking a situation to a current situation to a preferred one and rendering that with some form of intent. There's a big talk. There's a lot of talk on Twitter about, about what that really means and what really design is and what you can class as design. But it's it's inherently about having a vision of something that doesn't exist and then taking steps in order to create that vision. Now, I think part of the challenge of that is, and it's and it's something that I've been trying to explore on, on sort of Twitter in the last 24 hours is that design really came out of this idea that we just, especially out of the second world war as well, how, how we understand it, we just needed to create stuff and make stuff and get, get the economy going and everything else. And we've never really considered the consequences of all this stuff until relatively recently. And, and now we're having big conversations around ethics within design and, and all the, uh, and all of this stuff where, Everything was good for a while. And then, you know, Silicon Valley was great. We were doing all this user-centered stuff, making people's lives better, creating these apps and all this stuff. And now we're realizing that all that stuff's sort of being used against people and it's being used to manipulate people and take advantage. And we're now, now we're doing some real soul searching about what design really has. So we create futures as a name where it, it took took some time it's, after you think of a name it's, it seems quite simple but but it really was about how how we work with clients and about who's who's responsible for the work that we do and it's not it's not i create futures or or create futures it's about we so we work together to do something we don't only think about or theorize about what the future might be we put actionable steps into what we do in order for stuff to be made and futures as a as a plurality not about the future so future studies as a as a discipline as a practice is about the plurality of the future that there isn't one future there's not a future of work that there's so many articles talk about the future of work that well there there isn't a future of work there's there's a plurality of choices that we can make and the decisions that we make in the present lead us to whatever that future is. But the thing with design is that it's always, it always works on quite short, quite often works on quite short timelines. So sort of one to three years is how we, often we think about strategy or a design project. And, and even, the, even the big design project that we did for immigration, that was sort of three years probably something like that, maybe a little bit longer from, from initial conversation, but more and more we're told that we should be doing really rapid cycles of things. We, we're doing things in sprints. We're testing things with people. We're just doing, 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 but we don't really look at the consequences of what, we, of, uh, of what we might be doing. So it's really about, yes, design can be this really good thing, but let's think about the future more broadly. Let, let's think about our impact and what we want to create, what, what are aspirational things that we want to do. Let's question those things and have, and have some critical thought about those things. And let's be really purposeful in, in terms of creating positivity within what we're trying to do. But let's also acknowledge the plurality of these things as well. Let's acknowledge that what is good to me is awful to someone else. What like some of these dystopian, some of these white middle class dystopian futures that people put out into the world? It's like that that they are someone else's lived reality within the world at the moment. They're a they're a minority, or they're a you know they're a working class person in America, or they're they're, they're an indigenous person somewhere in the world. That's their lived experience. So let's really think deeply about these different futures and their consequences and the unintended consequences of what we might do. And let's be ready 
to deal with some of those unintended consequences rather than going, that's not our problem. We didn't really think of that. That's someone else's responsibility. We, we need to have much more integrity about what we create and, and how, that, how that impacts the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you know, really great. I really love your points and how you, you know, frame it and be yeah, uh, you know, like, you know, so many aspects around, uh, around that, especially I think the aspect around like, you know, we and the plurality, it's not just one answer, but uh, multiple answers. And, you know, you know, one more question to that would be, you know, where do you see it um, all going? Maybe it can be specifically to, you know, New Zealand in terms of you know, how design is evolved there, but also more of a, in a global context. What are some of the things you, you see for design coming and you know, maybe some also some of the challenges i think it really it really depends on what your perspective and outlook is within the world at the current moment you could be a designer going you know climate change is not a problem i think it's all all just man-made and i don't believe any of this stuff i think it's a left-wing conspiracy i'm just going to keep pumping out design work and making objects and doing all this stuff and i can't really do anything about it And then you can be on the other end of that spectrum going, wow, we're, we've got real problems and we're ignoring a lot of the stuff that's happening within the world. And how are we really going to make change? And, and maybe I could catalyze that change. Maybe I could be a part of that. I think we're in a, in a space where it's, re it's really uncertain. Yeah. So lots of people talk about this, uh, this idea of we, we live in a VUCA world, V-U-C-A. So it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And I think more than ever, we, we, we live in that environment. So we talked about data earlier on. We've never had so much data or never had so much information as we have now, and yet we're more confused than ever. Mm -hmm. like we, we don't know We don't know what's happening. We have all these different points of view. You can, if you have a point of view or you have an argument, you can quite easily find a counter point of view and a counter argument to that. And like, we just don't know. So, so it's just, like, just the idea of having so much data, it doesn't make you any wiser or any more able to make good decisions because there's all this other complexity that happens. There's all these human relationships and there's people that pay other people money and there's lobbying on on the behalf of you know different organizations and there's people's beliefs and people change their mind and all this stuff and it's really hard to think about how designers place themselves within that within that world and within an organization and within their jobs And, you know, it, it's easy for people to say, well, you're a designer. You shouldn't do this. You, you shouldn't make those things or work for that organization or you should tell your bosses to do these things. And, and we do see examples of that now. We, 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 we do see in firms, like, in firms like Amazon where internally they, they put pressure on the organization to go, you need to stand up around climate change. You need to do these things. Whether it is all too late in terms of us just ignoring everything that's been happening around us. And we're now in a position where, you know, I, I, I ran a, I ran a speculative design workshop last week with, with professor, associate professor Anne Galloway, who works at Victoria university. She, she, she's been doing like speculative design stuff for the last sort of decade. And we were talking about, Dunn and Raby's AB manifesto within that. And, and there's, there's an element of speculative design. So, so it was all about not being human centered and removing the human from the center of everything and actually looking at more than human centered worlds. And we were talking about, well, human centered design is about changing the world to fit us. And then speculation and like speculative design, critical design is all about changing us to fit the world. And, and I really wonder now how we've got to rethink about not being in control of the world anymore and how we're going to make the best of changing ourselves to be in this world that's going to be 
more extreme, more extreme weather patterns, all these things that are going to happen, how, how are designers going to react to that? How is industry going to change? What is economically going to be different in order to, what, what will we be sell, What will we be consuming? Will, will consumption change completely? Will there be a post-capitalist movement where we're, we're in a completely different space economically and how we exchange value? What does all this stuff mean? And I think these are the questions that designers are starting to ask themselves now. And I have got no idea. I've got no idea whatsoever how that future is going to play out. But part of the reason to do We Create Futures is actually understand that stuff more and help people position themselves for what might be to come. Yeah, yeah. there's so much in there, especially I think uh, what you were saying about uh, the counter movement sort of from um, human-centered design, like how you know, we maybe have to, you know, make the, the human fit more into the system uh, rather than fitting everything for the human, right? I mean, behavior design sort of falls into this category as well and how you can use speculative design, like you were saying. I mean, we, we I think what's interesting, we both met at, uh, you know, IDC. We, we didn't um, made it there to do record the, the podcast, but now we finally uh, did it and you know catch up a few weeks afterwards so it's a little bit delayed but maybe lo lo reflecting on idc and uh, the, your, your conference there and you gave a talk there and uh, you, you maybe had the chance to see also some talks you know maybe some of the things looking backwards you you really liked about the conference or just maybe some things you you were learning on the way or you know it, it would be something you know you took from the conference would be interesting yeah so for me, a conference is all about people. Like it's all about the people that you meet there, the conversations that you have after a talk. And talks can be great. And there were some really good talks there and, and, and some really sort of different styles of ways to do things and the, that always make you think, oh, could I present like that? Could I be a different presenter? The, the way that I present is very sort of off the cuff and, and I, I think about my talk and I run through it but then you know I'm, I, it's a very relaxed way that I present and I hope that sort of people have a bit of fun through that process but then your talk was like so slick and it had all these animations and I was like wow that, that like that is that's like just a different way to to engage people and then Michael's talk was super cool and and there was Shannon's talk that, that was sort of about design, but not really, and, and all about her personal journey. And, and, it's, and it's just really, it's always refreshing to, to see and, and look at different people's personalities and the ways that they do things and then go, oh, well, I, I probably couldn't do that, but I could use some of that or I could do this or, what, or, or like mm -hmm. trying to sort of pick things that you really liked or a way that someone did something out of their talk or or sort of brought the audience into the talk. So I, I always think that that's super cool. But like I said, going back to my point, to me, it's all about people. And just for me to go, just, I mean, I, even though I started We Create Futures as a business a few years before, a few months before it really started as a business, this is our one year anniversary, really. So the project that I talked about at IDC was, really personal to me. It was the first strategic foresight project that we really did. It was really modest. It was only small. But to get to go there and talk about that on that stage was a real honor for me to do. And, and, and I hope that I sort of made the most out of that opportunity. But also I know as well, I've had enough experiences talking at different places and uh, keynotes and whatever that the most interesting stuff is always speaking to other people. It's always like meeting other speakers and chatting to them afterwards, or it's the, the podcast that comes out of the back, or it's the, it's at the after party where you, you get to talk to someone about what they said and go into something in, in a quite deep way. That was really exciting for me, but it's also the journey, like the, the literal journey of going from New Zealand and having the whole journey experience and then meeting people and, and being in different places and making contacts with people and building relationships and then traveling onwards and traveling back to me is just a real privilege. 
and as well as all the good design stuff that comes out of there, that stuff is 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 a real privilege. What interested me, I suppose, was the the tide of some of the talks talking about more inclusivity within design, more representation of women, more inclusion of people of colour, women of colour, indigenous peoples from our perspective, as well as those quite industrial design related things that are about, you know, like visual brand or how how I made this thing or the history of a company, which is all really good stuff. But I, I, I think the nature of the conversation in lots of you know, design verticals or, or sort of disciplines now is, is, much, is, is starting to get much more introspective about how can we be more responsible about what we do? How can we be more inclusive about how we do things? And how can we recognize that the way we do things isn't just necessarily the best way to do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, also, you know, f and also for me, it was a really great experience and sharing some of the also your points uh, you were telling. Like, it's always super interesting to look at the different, also the different speaker styles. But then, obviously, also, you know, I think yeah, the conference are all about people and the connections you make. And yeah, I think we slowly have to wrap it up. Thank you, thank you so much for for sharing all that. You know, especially you know, I think it was great learning so much about New Zealand and the design industry there and the impact that's coming from design there in terms of government. Certainly some things I, you know, I, I learned. And yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing all that and uh, for your time. Thanks, Sebastian. That was the episode. If you want to give us feedback on the podcast, have something to contribute to the next episode, or just want to get in touch, feel free to connect with us either on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram messages, or simply via the designdrives.org website. We love to hear from you.